I'm not locked in here with you. That's it! You're locked in here with me! Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with The Rebel Broker. My name is Robert Whitelaw, and I am... The Rebel Broker, licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Towers. But please don't hold that against me. Welcome to Friday, folks. As promised, we're going to have kind of an interesting chat today. We're going to talk about two things. One, and this is, again, my local marketplace, right? And my local marketplace is, is pretty well known across the country. It's one of the ones everyone seems to pay attention to. Uh, Silicon Valley, which is basically Santa Clara County. Folks who live in other counties neighboring Santa Clara County will argue that they're part of Silicon Valley. That's all fine. But I like to use Santa Clara County as just a benchmark. Um, it's got a lot of diversity in it in terms of, of uh, the types of, of properties. It's got a lot of diversity in terms of the price ranges, all those kinds of wonderful things. So I think it gives you a good feel uh, for the market out here. Uh, other counties that as you go up the peninsula towards San Francisco are just get nuttier in terms of prices, those types of things. So I, I think it's a good market to look at. So we're going to do that. Second, we are going to talk about the one thing that I think might soften the blow of a of a real estate, of, of a downturn in the marketplace, which would result in a downturn in the, in the real estate marketplace. Um, and let's sort of, let's sort of get the broad picture stuff out of the way. We've talked about that a little bit already, but there's no, you know, no matter what angle you come at it from, a downturn should be expected, right? Whether you're one of those folks who simply believes in the cycle model where every seven to 10 years there is a downturn, right? Well, then we're more than ready. We're, we're more than primed for one. So one should be happening. Or you're someone who looks at, you know, we, and we've talked about a bunch of different metrics over the last year of things that point to bad stuff, like the prime lending rate being below the interest rate on various types of treasury notes, which we talked about last time. Um, there, there all, various inversion things relating to markets, Right. If you want to talk about indebtedness, if you want to talk about, uh, you know, the amount of fo the folks owe on cars or education or anything else, all of these things, the way money is being lent, the, the way those that is being handled, the subprime lending, no matter which angle you come at this from, I think there is reasonable expectation, no tinfoil hats required, that there is a reasonable expectation that we're going to head into a downturn, right? I, I don't. And I don't think anyone who says sits down and says right now within the next year expect a downturn year to eighteen months, right? I don't. I don't think anyone there is necessarily wrong. Uh, I, I think there's a really good chance that that it either will happen within that time or within the next two years. I think. I think that's a very reasonable expectation. Um, however, I think in using the most recent downturn as a model or a template, because most of us at least to some degree can remember it, right? I know a lot of it's like for women going through labor pains, you know, once it's all over, maybe during it, you swear you're never going to have another kid. And then a year later, all those wonderful chemicals have allowed you to forget how painful that process was. And now you're up for potentially thinking about another child. I think that this is, I don't know why I went to that example. I, I now almost regret it, uh, but I'm not going to edit it out because there it is. Um, and that's, you know, we, a lot of us, I think, have forgotten some of the pain that occurred last time. Uh, and then there's others of us who keenly remember it. And I, I think I'm one of those folks who absolutely has it uh, seared into my brain uh, simply because of all the different folks I was working with at the time who were experiencing very bad stuff. Um, but for, so so all of that in play, where are we now? What, what does my market show right now? And there are some interesting numbers. Um, for, to, to kind of bring everyone up to date the last time we kind of had a conversation about this, um, for, and first of all, I want to make sure you also understand this is very much about your local marketplace, but we're going to talk about numbers and stats that you can find out in your local markets to figure out where you place, right? Because I, I honestly think things may go swimmingly longer in my marketplace unless there's just a huge drop, right? And some folks are claiming that's a good odd that, that the next big thing that's going to happen 
is going to be a big economy thing. It's going to be uh, a lot of layoffs and things like that. So, and if that happens, remember, one of the things I've always said that underpins real estate is employment. If suddenly there's a ton of folks getting laid off, particularly in high tech, if there's a bubble, uh, and one thing that could be a bubble would be a dramatic reduction in stock prices for a lot of different companies that are here in Silicon Valley. Um, the reason why that would be the case is companies tighten their belts in those situations. They prepare for bad things, and that equals holding more cash, reducing expenses, and tightening belts, and tightening belts often equals layoffs, okay? So with all that in mind, uh, one thing that I've brought up in the past has been the idea that while the market has slowed a bit, the only thing that has slowed is the rate that property values increase. So in other words, we haven't seen uh, homes go down in price. We've simply seen the amount people pay come closer and closer to asking price. And let me let me lay that out for you. We're going to we're going to consider our first numbers here. And I'm looking at numbers that are literally up to the minute. I ran these numbers within the last 10 minutes and I am looking and just so everyone else is aware, I am going to do a video version of this so you can see the stats I'm talking about uh, and that'll be posted to YouTube. So if you're interested in seeing the video version of this, that will go to YouTube. Unfortunately, I'm not able to do it right now. I had a failure in my video setup, so I'm going to have to do it as a separate thing, uh, but it will be posted to YouTube. So you might want to go over and check out the YouTube channel in order for you to see that. You can, if you just do a search on Rebel Broker on YouTube, I believe you will find my channel there. Um, okay. So let's think about really just the last couple of years, um, and the chart I'm looking at here is for the past three years, and it shows two things. It shows days on market, and the interesting thing to note there is there is virtually no change in days on market other than the last year that we had was the best year we've seen in the last three years. Uh, and by that, I mean at the best time of year, which tends to be, you know, April, you know, March, April, May, June, right in there. We were seeing days on market right around 13, 13, 14 days on market. At the worst time of the year, which tends to be November, you know, October, November, December, January, we were seeing peaks of around 35 to 36 days. Okay, well, last year that number peaked at 36 days. This year it peaked at 35. Uh, so what's going to happen now over the next three months? It's going to dramatically drop as it has every year for the past three. And it's going to end up settling somewhere in the sub-20 range. So anywhere from... 12 to to uh, 20 days. And, and that's been the cycle. That cycle has remained co pretty constant. And, and, you're, and you're, if you look back, you don't see much variation. Here's where you see the variation. And it's a biggie. If you look at the uh, sales price to list price ratio, and so this, and, and the difference is the list price is how much someone was asking for a home, and the sales price is how much someone paid for it. And we have two very interesting diverging numbers that I think are very informative. Uh, one is over the last three years, the largest peak in people paying over asking price was in the summer months of 2018. So this last year was when we saw the biggest jump in that. Now, if we run these same numbers and look back at the last five years, we see that even in that time frame, it was the highest. So it peaked up just shy of 14% above asking price. Uh, last year, it peaked at about 5% over asking price. The year before that, it was almost 8%. The year before that, it was about 6%. That's all very interesting. And it never got lower than about 1.8 or 1.5%. However, the most recent numbers are the lowest we have seen in the last five years. So let me repeat that. Prices now have gotten to the point where homes are tending to sell for asking price and not more than asking price. So, for instance, let's if I look at the um, the past twelve months, what I see is as and I don't want to the December numbers are actually kind of interesting. The December numbers were 
100.1. So 0.1% above asking was the average. In November, just last month, it was 100.6. In October, it was 102.3. And then before that, it was 102.7. Before that, in, in August, it was... What does that say? 104.6. In July, it was 104 point. Well, that's not correct. Yes, it was 104 point. It was 104.6, 102.7 in August, 104.6 in July. In June, it was 108.5, and it peaked back in March at 113.2. All right. So a dramatic drop in that number, which tells you fewer offers per property, right? Because that's that's what increases that number. That's what makes that number go up. You get multiple offers. People in a multiple offer situation offer more than asking price. And this indicates less of that has been happening. So the big thing that we want to see is, do we get the statistical jump in that number that we normally get once we get into January, February, March, it usually builds up to January, February, March, and April, and then starts its descent again, right? That's usually when we, when we see that happening. So the first couple of months of this year are going to be very interesting. January and February, can't wait to see what this number does. But let's remember that over the past five years, we're currently at the lowest we've ever been in terms of amount over asking price. We're literally 0.1% over asking price in the month of December of 2018. So I think that in and of itself is a very interesting number and obviously indicates there are fewer buyers out there buying. Now, a lot of folks can are talking about how that interest rates are affecting that. Um, but what's also interesting to note is what's happening with inventory. Now, the first numbers I like to look at with inventory relate to total number of active sales, or total number of active listings versus the total number of sales in the same time period. And what I'm looking at now is data going back to January of 2016. Now, in January of 2016, what I see is, well, in all of 2016, I see amazing numbers of active homes listed, surprisingly enough, and the number of sales far below that. In 2018, I see the same thing. What's interesting is in 2017, I see a dramatic increase in sales that outpaces inventory. So what's interesting to note is while we saw really crazy numbers, even, even coming through two numbers in 2016 and 2017, given the tightness of the inventory in 2017, we would expect to see a gigantic increase in 2017. Now, we'll look at numbers later to see what's going on there. But we're, we're still seeing uh, in a market where what I'm seeing just by these numbers, if I was to guess, I would guess that prices peaked in 2017 and actually declined a little bit in 2018, just because of the inventory numbers I'm seeing. But we all know that's not the way it worked, right? We know that on a on a month and a, a same time last year model where we look at what prices were, we've seen on average increases in sales prices year to year. So we'll take a look at that next. Now, the other thing I like to look at in terms of uh, inventory is number of homes listed Versus new listings versus sold homes. Now, that gives you an idea of sort of the ebb and flow, right, in terms of who's adding properties to the marketplace. Now, if we go back just over the last uh, 12 months, we see that uh, we've pretty much had new listings outpacing sales, uh, which, which, is, which is fairly normal. In December, we saw a very strong reversal of that where we saw a huge number of sales, 845 sales versus 410 new listings. So we very much ate into the stockpile of homes that was being added over the course of the year as we saw listings. Now, if we go back more, if we go back, let's say, three years on these numbers to look for any variations, what are we seeing in terms of changes? Um, it looks pretty typical with the with drops in the same places. And as we look back over this data, we see that's pretty normal. Uh, for instance, the reversal that I mentioned in the month of December of 2018, similar in 2017, similar in 2016. So in terms of trends, no huge changes there. So we've talked about what the inventory has been doing. We've talked about what listings have been doing. The next thing I want to look at is 
what have prices been doing? Now, this is where things start to get interesting, and this is where we could make the argument that we're starting to see a pivot point. Because remember what I've said, all along, we've tended to see when you do a year-to-year comparison, the same month in 2018 compared to the same month in 2017, we've tended to see an increase in that price. And that's always the way I've suggested that you all look at it. Well, for the first time uh, since we've been doing this data, we're seeing situations where we're, compared to the same month last year, we're not seeing increases. So let's take a look at December of 2018, where the average sales price in Santa Clara County was, and this is a crazy number, $1,255.271. All right, or excuse me, $1,251,271. Okay, if we go back and we look at the same month in 2017, that average price was $1,367,181. Now, you might immediately take that as a, oh my God, we're, we're there, things are starting to decline. But the reality is, over the last year, the big change that we've seen in Santa Clara County has been a softening in the luxury market. We've seen builders building lots of luxury homes, not getting them, and those aren't getting sold. Right, builders are actually struggling with those with those homes, and the top end, the luxury end, has just fallen out. So we're not getting the same level of influence from the luxury end as we used to. The sales just aren't as robust there, and I would argue that a lot of this has to do with that. However, I think that only offsets it by a percentage, by a, by a chunk. It's not solely responsible because we're simply seeing too many other things that are indicating a softening. Uh, if we look at uh, November of 2018 versus November of 2017. Uh, one November of 2017 was one million four hundred one dollars and five one million four hundred one thousand five hundred and ten dollars, and then in the same time period this month one million three hundred sixty three thousand. Obviously less. If we look at October of 2018, one million four hundred forty four thousand. We look at October of 2017, 1307000 so an increase. So we're right on that edge. I kind of think we've reached that point where we've peaked out and things are starting to go down a little bit. And if you look at this chart, it kind of feels that way. Um, if, you, if you note that there's always going to be um, variations, seasonal variations in the up and the down, I think we do tend to see a bit more of a down than normal um, than we have in past years when you look at these numbers for the last three years. So in terms of what I'm seeing, in terms of what the market is doing right now, I would call it as softening to the point where we may see in markets prices below what they were a year ago in many markets. But I think that's going to be a find it where you see it thing. And let me explain what I mean by that. As I mentioned before, the luxury market has softened. So for all of those homes and a lot of these markets that would be considered at the luxury end of the the spectrum, a lot of those folks that expect to sell their homes for more than it was worth a year ago in the first half of 2019 are going to be disappointed. Uh, the luxury end has absolutely softened, and I think it, that that's where it's going to be hit the most. I think once you get into some of the more mainstream markets, what's going to happen is instead of taking a cut, you'll be flat. We've sort of reached that place where I think the mainstream housing segment is going to be relatively flat, where you're paying 100% of list price, maybe even a little bit below list price. Um, and I don't know what that spells for you. Uh, and for me, in my marketplace... I'm kind of thinking that indicates a position to wait. Uh, I, if, if, for instance, in, in my personal case, I've I've been fooling around with this idea of selling my property forever now. For I think we're on year two, um, and I've been struggling with the decision because it really is a either or decision. Do I sell the home and take out the capital and do other things with that capital and and potentially get a greater return? Or do I hold on to the property and rent it, which would rent for a pretty respectable positive cash flow, and continue to ride that? Because here's the other side of this equation. I don't see rental rates going down. I think they've been relatively flat for a while, but they have definitely not gone up 
with the increase in quote unquote property values over that same period of time. Uh, I keep a pretty good eye on the rental market. And what I do is I subscribe to a list and I get uh, from, from Trulia and I keep an eye on three bedroom, two bath or more homes in various areas. And I keep track of what the rents are going for in those areas. And I keep track of how quick they go off the market. Uh, the ones that go off the market or are taken off of Trulia and Zillow. Those are ones that are renting. And there has not been a lot of motion. There was a bit of an uptick early last year to middle of last year that didn't last and properties that were up at those higher ends stayed on the market forever. And I saw a lot of homes for rent that uh, had reductions in rent or what they wanted to get for rent. So I haven't seen a commensurate increase in rent. So I don't think we're going to see a drop in that, particularly if we see a softening in the economy where there will be a greater demand for rental properties. Now, so that's the residential world, which is still relatively strong. I mean, you, you, you could make the argument it's, it's strong enough that it's going to remain flat. What's interesting about my area and what may be true about yours is we've dramatically overbuilt on uh, multifamily housing, so apartment complexes. And the lending world still seems very willing to lend for that stuff, and the building world still seems very willing to build the stuff. And I would argue that that is – an opportunity in the future, but I don't think that's going to last. Nobody wants to live typically under those circumstances. There are some developments where I've seen where apartment complexes are ridiculous. They are crammed in there like sardines without a lot of amenities. There are others where they've built smartly where down the road they could be converted into condominiums where I think people would pay a reasonable amount for them because it's it's halfway comfortable living. Uh, the 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 bad example of what they've done comes to mind that's right off of the 85 freeway here in Santa Clara County, uh, where it seems like there's nine buildings that are each like 10 or 15 stories tall, and everybody's just jam-packed in there. Um, if those end up going condo, I think those will be very inexpensive to buy. The desirability there is just not that high. Okay, so we've kind of ironed that out. I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, We'll probably talk a little bit more about numbers I'm seeing in the marketplace, but we're also going to talk about the one element that is happening that I think potentially prevents the same level of downturn in property values as last time. Maybe you agree with me, maybe you don't, but we'll talk about it in a minute and you can see if you're on the same page as I am. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Are you ready to jump in and start your search for your first investment property? Maybe you've decided that it's time to own your own home or maybe you're ready to sell your home and move on to something new. No matter what your goal is, The Rebel Broker can help. That's right. Aside from hosting this show, I am also the owner broker of White Lawn Sons Real Estate Services right here in Silicon Valley. With over 25 years experience serving Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy, I or one of my great agents can help you achieve your goals in real estate. So if you're ready to look into taking that next step towards achieving your real estate goals, point your browser at www.soldbyrobert.com. That's www.soldbyrobert.com. Robert.com and get in touch. Let me show you how I will earn your business and your respect. Again, that's www.soldbyrobert.com or you can call me at 408-852-0525. California Bureau of Real Estate ID 00984909. Hello everyone, welcome back. We're continuing our conversation about the state of the market right now. And we're going to be correcting, well, not correcting, but modifying for my local market a statement I made earlier. Now, I talked about earlier how there was a softening in the luxury market, and that's absolutely happening nationally. And there are sub markets within my area that are absolutely experiencing this. However, what's interesting to note is that if we look at uh, sales, the, the amount of homes that make up sales in various price groups, we find that you know, we aren't really seeing a huge softening in the luxury market in terms of the share of overall homes sold. So I I ran the numbers for just the last um, six months. And I see that our, the peaks are where they've always been uh, in the past relating to the the biggest peak being between the 800,000 to $1 million mark. That's, that's our biggest peak with, in the year of, from July of 2018 to December of 2018, we saw 1,295 homes sold in that price bracket. The next highest price bracket 
is 1.2 to 1.4 million with 967 homes. The next highest to that is 600 to 800,000 with 909. The next highest below that is 2 to 3 million with 617 homes sold. And so what we what I was using for that then is to sort of get an idea of how do we see changes over the last year? Well, if we look at January to December of 2018, that trend continues to hold. We we tend to see the same ratio split up uh, between those price bands with only two of the top four price bands being below a million dollars. The other two are above. If we go back to January of 2017 to December of 2017, we see a much higher focus, which would indicate softer luxury home sales. We much see much higher focus in that uh, 600 to $1 million range. So the 600 to $800,000 homes, 2,905 homes were sold in that price range. In the 800,000 to a million range, 2,982 homes were sold. Then that 1.2 to $1.4 million range saw 1,669 homes sold. Then it jumps down to uh, the 400 to $600,000 range where 1,460 homes were sold. Then it's the $2 million to $3 million homes sold. 1,327 of those got sold. And we, start, and we tend to see the same performance in 2016. But what's interesting to note is the period of time with the greatest percentage of homes sold being in the luxury segment is 2018. Huge number of homes in the $2 million to $3 million range were sold uh, in 2018. Um, fewer homes were sold in the eight hundred dollars to $100,000 range in 2018 than were sold in 2017. Uh, but way more homes were sold in uh, the 2016 range where we saw the number one performing range being the six hundred dollars to 800000 dollar range with 3,447 homes, then the next highest. So it was a reversal, a reversal of those numbers where the 800,000 to a million dollar homes made up uh, were accounted for by 2,904 homes. And then the next highest was that 400 to $600,000 range with 2,066 with that luxury 1.2 to $1.4 million range coming in at fourth. So instead of seeing it coming in at second, as we saw in other areas, um, or third, it came in fourth. So that's interesting, right? It's a shift. But what's odd is, as we've seen the softening in luxury homes, this most recent year saw the greatest number of sales of luxury homes at those price points. Now, to integrate one more concept that makes it a little bit more complicated is we want to also consider price reductions. What 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 instances did we see homes reduced in price? Now, unfortunately, that's not a number that I can run in this way in terms of easy numbers to run because the number I would really want would be home gets listed, the list price gets reduced over time, and then finally sell, sells for some amount of money right? Well, the numbers I'm sharing with you now, when we talk about sales price to list price ratio, that's referring to the list price at the time at which the home sold. It doesn't take into account homes that reduced their prices prior to getting that offer. I think that's an important number to be aware of. And in terms of anecdotally, what I, the homes I watch, the homes that show up in lists, when I get alerts, I get alerts for price reductions. When I get those alerts, They are always at the higher end of the market, and I get more of them. So I've gotten more of them in 2018, and the vast majority of them were the higher end. In fact, I can't even recall any that were below $1.2 to $1.3 million over the last six months to a year. So all those dynamics come together for me and paint a picture of, again, we're seeing a, a flavor of softening at the high end that's hard to define based on when we just break down price banding in terms of the number of homes over the last year that sold at different price bands because that data clearly indicates that homes at the higher end are selling very pretty well. Uh, but I think what we're also needing to, to embrace is this idea that we're now in a market where after a dramatic increase in... Uh, what folks were paying up to you know 113% of list price 
Now we're in a market in the same year where we're paying list price, right? So that kind of gives us information on where we're going. Now, this is all data that your real estate agent in your local area should be able to generate for you. I'm doing an entire county. It gets interesting when you start doing it in smaller submarkets like San Martin, where the San Martin's the town just south of me. I live in Morgan Hill, uh, Gilroy. When you start doing just the cities, these numbers tend to get interesting in terms of giving you info that you can actually use in making decisions on what you think makes sense for your market. Now, when I do that for my market, for the Morgan Hill market, I see that we are now to the point where we are getting homes sold at below what the list price was. In fact, uh, I'm seeing it at 1%. Uh, We're getting 99.1%. So Morgan Hill is is hovering about 1% below what we're seeing in the county overall. Uh, We actually had the lowest point was in, um, it looks like August. What is that? Is that August or September? August of 2016, where we're at 98.3%. Uh, but we've been over 100% for uh, since March of 2017 and didn't get below 100% until October of 2018, where we peaked not as high as the county in general. The county in general, again, went almost up to 100, went up to 114. We went to 104%. So in my local marketplace, I'm seeing interesting stuff relating to a couple of different things that explain this. One, sellers that continue to have the perception that they can get more for their home. So they're listing artificially high and continuing to increase that number. The other thing is an actual softening and multiple things have come into play, right? We have seen uh, interest rates go up to the point where I think we can start arguing that that is having a effect. Um, we are also have seen recently interest rates go down where then that's boosted sales a bit. Now, I was poo-pooing the influence of interest rates uh, up until recently because I think th- because of the prices that we're at, I think it's becoming more of an influence uh, and also because we have seen the dwindling of the number of buyers that are out there independent of interest rates. Um, I made the argument a year ago that the, the fluctuating up and down of the marketplace was having very little to do with interest rates and more to do because there wasn't a cor- correlation, right? We looked at those numbers at the time and you would see that despite the fact interest rates went up, the number of homes sold actually went up. Uh, and in many cases, the prices went up. So that wasn't it. But I think we can start to say that on buyer decisions, interest rates are start- starting to have an effect. Um, and I'm not sure what that equals because other numbers that would that would feed confidence have indicated higher confidence. We've seen uh, net income go up. Employment is at the best it's been in 50 years. Uh, but we have also seen people taking on more debt uh, in those time frames. In fact, we, on average, we see increases in income on a level where it's half what they end up increasing in their de- indebtedness, which is kind of bizarre, but also has been a trend now for the last couple of years. Um So where does that leave us in a marketplace? I think it leaves us in the marketplace if you're a buyer. I think it's a good place to start being patient and start waiting to see what you might be able to get in terms of a deal. Uh, If you are a seller, I think that we've reached that point where things have declined enough where you've, in many markets, you may have already missed the absolute peak. Uh, But again, this first quarter of 2019 will be the indicator. Now, if I'm going to sell, I need, I should do it too sweet, uh, in my estimation. Uh, but let's talk for a minute about something else. And I, I, at the beginning of the show, I hinted at it, well, came out and specifically said it. What's the one thing that's likely, likely to soften these blows? And it's something we've talked about on the show before. And that is new home construction. Now, for those of you who haven't been listening to the show very long, um, let me lay it out for you. When construction ramped up, up until about 2000, 2008, it was insane. Uh, The chart for new construction is like, is the proverbial hockey stick. And then that number peaks out at 2007, 2008, and then drops to what seems like almost zero and never gets higher than about, I don't know, 15, 20, 25% of what it once was. So construction never ramped up at least not for single-family residential. Um, 
The only kind of building we saw really was for multifamily. And in my opinion, in a lot of areas, we overbuilt there, but kind of had to because there were no other options. But I never like it when you see a market lopsided towards the least desirable type of housing, right, which, which is that which is apartments. Nobody wants to stay in apartments. And when I, when I get people who are looking for a, their first home, they're usually renting an apartment. And the reason why they were encouraged to make a buying decision earlier rather than later was because they're sick and tired of the folks above them and below them and to the left and the right of them. And they're just tired of it, right? So what is it? Since we didn't do all that building, there is simply not the supply to really flood the market like it was last time. We're in one of those situations where we didn't have, like we did last time, we have all the, a lot of the other things that led to a bad marketplace last time are here again. However, not the buildup of homes. So while it was a bad thing for a certain period of time, if, if builders had actually just built at a reasonable clip, and I, it's hard to just blame builders. I mean, in being fair, it, ha, it became ridiculously expensive to build a home in, in particularly my area. We've talked about this before on past shows. If you want to go do a quick search at the website, therebelbroker.com to find those, where in that same time period from 2000 to 2008, the regulations and the fees and what some people would argue would be the strong arm money grabbing tactics used by county, city and and state folks who wanted to get a piece of the real estate pie made building single family residential homes for the mainstream buyer a ridiculously uh, not profitable way to go. Um, and I've mentioned on the show before, if we were to strip back all the rules, all the regulations and all the fees back to the year 2000 standard, I think we would have, we would have had folks building homes at a clip for the, for the mainstream middle road average price, uh, that would have made this market far more healthy, but we didn't. So they didn't do it. They never got to the point where they, where they even came close to building half the rate that they were building leading up to 2008. So because we simply have fewer homes out there and because the supply and demand equation is always there, the inevitable supply is just not likely to be able to reach what it was before because we didn't add that much in comparison to what was added just before the last downturn. So what does that equal? It potentially, if we see the downturn that we expect, I think that we see flattening and reductions in prices, but I don't think we see 30% drops in real estate values. Um, Could I be wrong? Absolutely. I would be far more confident that that would be true if we had built more homes to begin with. But then again, if we built more homes to begin with, prices wouldn't have ramped up as much as they did to see where we are now, right? This, This crazy plateau that we've reached. All right. So in my marketplace, I think it's a it's if you're looking at exiting, this is not a bad time. If you're looking at becoming a a landlord, it's not a bad time for that. I honestly don't think whatever comes is going to reduce rents that much in my head. I am thinking if if it is a worst case scenario where we do see rents get hit, I don't see rents getting hit by more than 10 percent. 15%. So as I do my math, I'm assuming I'm going to have to reduce my rent 10%, 15% to potentially attract good tenants. Uh, And even then I'm still great with positive cash flow. I expect you folks to look at your markets and figure out what that math, what math on that area makes sense for you. I think the data shows that at least in my marketplace, we're definitely at a pivot point. If we look at the data for other markets, whether you want to talk about Phoenix, Sacramento, San Diego, all these other areas, as we mentioned on a, on a previous show, we're not only seeing a increase in inventory, a reduction in sales, but also a flattening to softening of prices. And I think in some of those more aggressive markets, a lot of it is explained in the same way that we've kind of got it explained here in Santa Clara County. If you're a buyer, if you can wait, do it. If you're a seller, either do it now or consider becoming a uh, landlord. I, I'm all, I'm really kind of in a, in a wait and see suggestion mode here. I would say, let's see what happens in January and February. Because of the kind of pivot we've seen over the last six months, I would expect to see very interesting numbers in that first quarter if we're going to continue into a downturn. That's anything real estate related. Because remember, the last time this happened, real estate was the problem last time, right? 
the the overlending, the overbuilding, and, and the oversecuritization of these loans, these these subprime loans, the huge push to make subprime loans. Now we've got a big push to make subprime loans now too. We don't have those other elements though in terms of inventory, which we just talked about. But this time around, it feels like the downturn is likely to come more from something else, more on par with the downturn we saw in 2000, 2001 with the uh, tech bubble, if anyone remembers that one. I think it's likely to come from somewhere out there. And that tended to be a milder and more short-lived downturn. We're talking 18 months, right, where there was an opportunity window there. Uh, I think that's on par with what we're likely to see here. So... Fasten your seatbelt. I think interesting times are coming. What is the old Chinese curse? May you live in interesting times. Um, I think there are so many balls in the air right now. It's hard to make a a, a firm recommendation, but I, I, I am not somebody who's suggesting that the stuff's just going to continue to ramp up. I, I honestly think best case scenario, given the numbers we're seeing across Santa Clara County in general and in my market specifically, depending on where you live, if you were someone to say, what can I expect for selling my house? Um... I would say if you're here in Morgan Hill, don't expect uh, to see growth in your price. Expect to list it and sell it for under what you're listing. Uh, if you're in Santa Clara County, I would say, you know, you could probably get it what we list it for if we pick the right price. Uh, and if, if that changes and this first quarter is going to be amazing, remember what we've seen, things that have changed in the last few years for the marketplace is that the market started much earlier, Right. We've talked about how we started to see more listings and more sales coming online in February and March than in previous years. I want to see if we sort of return to a marketplace where that stuff gets soft and stays soft and and sort sort of reflects a market that we saw back before the big downturn. We'll wait and see what happens. Again, fasten your seatbelt. I think it's going to be an interesting ride. All right. Now, if any of you have any ideas, suggestions, or observations you'd like to make relating to the show, it's very easy to reach out to me. You can find me at therebelbroker.com. Just click the contact button in the top menu, and you'll be able to send along a message. You can also click the big red button at the top of the page, uh, and that will help me grow the show. It's an opportunity for me to uh, get some, some uh, not for me to get it, but for some folks who host my uh, my show to get some uh demographic information from you, understand what kind of folks are listening to the podcast, and you will uh, get put into a drawing for a $50 gift card, which we will do. We're going to start doing that again. We stopped doing that for a while. We're going to go ahead and do that again uh, on February 1st. So jump in. Uh, You'll get yourself into that drawing for a $50 Amazon gift card, and we will reach. And that's how I reach you. So you want to use the same email address both times you're asked because the way you win it is through your email address. So if you don't use an email address that you use on a regular basis, you're not going to be able to get that $50 Amazon gift card. Now, for those of you, my wonderful listeners who jumped in and have done this before, you're still in there. You're still in the drawing. So if you did this a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, you're still in the mix to potentially win that $50 gift card. So don't worry, I'm not leaving you guys behind. Finally, as is always the case, my goal is to leave you with far more knowledge on the table than time invested. Hope we've achieved that today. Appreciate you taking the time out. Talk to y'all next time.